Our lectures today are by uh, Jody Garcia and Gay Callen. And um, Jody is a third generation Calaveras County resident and has spent her entire life around vineyards and winemaking with her parents. And Jody grew up to appreciate the hard work and dedication it takes uh, to produce each bottle of wine. And um, when she gra after she graduated from Sonoma State, she made the decision to move back to Calaveras County so she could stay involved in her hometown community and be close to her family. <laughs> and then Gay is founder and owner of Chatham Vineyards, and she's a Calaveras wine country legend as she has spent 40 years farming grapes and winemaking. Oh <laughs> And she moved to Esmeralda Valley in Calaveras County in 1980 and got to know uh, winemaking through Barton Stevenot, Steve Miliere, and Chuck Hovey. And in 1990, she uh, had Chatham Winery built in Douglas Flat, and she built the Chatham brand into a successful business before selling in 2015. And she has helped shape our wine region in what it is today. And um, one of the things I wanted to let you know, our next lecture is February 4th, and it's going to be uh, Joel Metzger about the Utica Power. And I want to thank Gina for always bringing the refreshments. She's been a real trooper for me. And she does all of the promos and everything for it. So I thank you. And also thank you to Susan Tomasich because she's from she does all of our videotaping and has also um, as a volunteer, and she does a great job. So I want to present um, Jody Garcia and Gay Callen. Hello, everybody. Um, as she said, I'm Jody, and this is Gay. So our Calaveras winemaking history started with the gold rush. Um, it really took off during that time. Um, so we're kind of going to go through starting with the gold rush and then a little bit of the kind of renaissance when it came back after prohibition um, to today. So just a quick recap of who we are. Um, established in 18 or 1989, we are a nonprofit that is dedicated to increasing the awareness of all the wines produced in Calaveras Can County and or Calaveras grapes. So we do a lot of events, um, marketing, kind of really just to promote our region to the state of California and the world. These are some of our, our fun events. You might recognize a few people there. Um, meetups, grape stomp, we do vineyard tours, and um, wine tasting events. So to start off, um, during the gold rush, when the immigrants started coming over from Europe, they started bringing vines. Um, we were chatting with Judith earlier about when the first, you know, how, it, where the vines are that have been around the longest, all over, pretty much all over the county. Um, you can find them just about everywhere. So um, the first thousand vines were in the lowest, lower Calaveras River in 1851. By 1857, there were about 6,500 vines, and then that number quadrupled a year later. So really back in that time, it was somewhat safer to drink wine than it was water. Um, so they were used to drinking wine in Europe, and they just continued that with a lot of home winemaking at that time. Um, and then into commercial at a later date. And then the first boom peaked in 1866 when there was um, <coughs> over 500,000 vines in the county. And like I said, this was all over the county. Um, so pretty much anywhere that they were, you know, mining gold, they were planting vineyards. So in the late 1800s, um, we became the fourth largest wine producing region in California um, after Los, uh, Los Angeles, Sonoma, and El Dorado. So it really is a testament to the gold miners and how much they were planting back then. And by 1870, a reporter um, reported that we were producing over six million, or had over six million producing vines. So just 
boom, just like the gold rush, um, you know, or it was more liquid gold. It just kept, kept going. Um, and then this is a vineyard um, back in the 1800s in Milk Hill. So kind of after the gold rush, the boom kind of slowed down just a bit. Um, so there wasn't that many vines um, planted in the 1870s and early 1880s. But in 1880, we were producing almost 50,000 gallons um, of wine on 312 acres. One of those um, being the great grandfather to the Tanner family Angelo, um, he was the first licensed winemaker in Calaveras County. So it kind of a testament to, to the Tanner family. They've had winemaking in their blood for a long time. Um, by, the 19, by 1900, we really decreased um, production and we're producing about 26,000 on 100 acres. And then prohibition hit. When Prohibition hit, um, you would think that it would kind of cut off the wine growing. Um, it didn't. So you could still grow grapes and make wine for um, sacramental purposes and for home winemaking. So the ones that were doing, you know, commercial vineyards were transitioning to home winemaking. So it actually had a boom again because everyone kind of started making it underground for, you know, their own personal use, other things. Um, so we increased back up to 445 by 1924. So, you know, it just took a, took a little different boom, um, but a little more underground. And then after prohibition, um, with the glut of vineyards, when you could start selling it again, we kind of took another hit. So oversupply with, um, the amount of grapes we had, not as many, you know, commercial winemakers, everyone's kind of getting their feet off the ground. And then to more of the modern day. So um, Chispa Sellers, Bob Bliss and Jim Riggs, they bonded Chispa Sellers in 1976. They were the first bonded licensed winery in over 40 years. So they kind of had the vision to start it back up. Um, you know, we like to say we have a lot of pioneering spirit here in Calaveras and they were one of the first ones that took the initiative and, and said, we're gonna start making wine again. Um, so this is one of their labels. Zinfandel, only 12% alcohol. You won't find many Zins with only 12% alcohol <laughs> nowadays. Um, so Chispa was purchased, um, was sold in 1984 to Dave and Jan Olson. Um, they kind of also had the vision, they renamed it to Black Sheep and then they later sold it to Stephen Liz and Millier who own it today. Um, so Black Sheep kept Chispa's bonded license number, um, which is still the longest running um, license winery here in, in Calaveras. And then to today. Um, so these are some of the, the modern day pioneers. There is a lot of them that we're not gonna touch on. Um, these are just a few. So kind of in order, we have Barton Stevenow, Chuck Hubby, Stephen Collum, Steve Millier, um, John and Gail Kautz, and our lovely gay. <laughs> <laughs> so as we go through, we'll kind of touch on their history and then because Gay knows um, and was with them, we'll let her kind of give some stories about them. So we're gonna start off with Barton. So where Chispa Sellers started, you know, with that pioneer spirit, Barton really took it and ran with it. He, um, I'm sure a lot of you um, know, if you don't know him, you know of him. He was a really big entrepreneur in the area, got Carson Mine going again, was a big part of Greenhorn Creek. Um, he had the vision to just, he knew what the wine industry up here was gonna be before it was anywhere close to that. So in the late uh, 1960s, he purchased a Shaw Ranch um, on San Domingo Creek near Murphy's and established a, or reestablished a vineyard there. Um, later, then establishing the winery itself. So, Gay, do you have any 
any stories about Barden? Yeah, well, well nothing, <laughs> nothing too blasphemous. Um, I planted our vineyard. I came up here in 1980 and planted our vineyard in 81 for the Stephen O brand. And at the time, I believe Barden had maybe 20 to 30 acres of, of vineyard. And um, we did ours in three different stages. So I, the first planting that we did was Chenin Blanc and Chardonnay, and then um, Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet, and then Semillon, Zinfandel, and Merlot. So it's everything that we cultivated originally went to the Stephen O label. And once Barden continued to grow, he was buying fruit from Amador County, uh, us in Calaveras County, he had his own vineyard and with reaching out, he needed more fruit and was buying more fruit from other vineyards and I lost some of the contracts. It, it kind of mid 80s was when we made the decision to start having wines crafted for us. Um, his, his vision was huge. And he really, while, while Bob and Jim were the original vintners in, in our community to, you know, to, re, to re-flourish in our community, Barton was really the one that set the stage for a number of us to come up and test the waters. Because Calaveras in the late 70s and early 80s was only really known for the jumping frog. And so the liquid gold, as you, as you referred to, really became something that the Gerbers were interested in, the couches became interested in. Um, Steve Millier came from the coast, so did Chuck Hovey. And so it, it's by the mid 80s, mid to late 80s, you were seeing a, a new flourishing of the wine country. And while we, we, Chatham, were able to hold on to the largest vineyard for a number of years, we were at 65 acres. Um, I believe the Gerber family, when they, when they finished planting, they were over 150 to close to 200 acres. So his vision was really something that opened not just a, a business opportunity for people, but another opportunity for employment and continue with ag in our community on a different level. And, and also the vision of bringing the right kind of vinifera and grapes to our community because all of our soils are so different. Where Stephen O was, had more limestone, we have more sandy loam and just rock. I don't know why we <laughs> grow rock, but we have rock. So it's, you know, his vision over the years um, was really something that he spearheaded. And, and all of us, you know, that are in this, in this industry look back and we really have to thank him for everything that he did. Um, I knew nothing about putting a grape in the vine, in the, in the ground, and so I went back to Davis to took, class, took classes. I didn't need another degree, but it was, um, it was because of his inspiration that I came up, I stayed, uh, and proceeded to, you know, continue with growing grapes and making wine. Chuck Hovey was, um, I, bu- I believe that Steve, well, yeah, Chuck Hovey was his second, not second, because uh, Julia Iantoska and her husband um, were really the, the first of his winemakers to, to get him on the map. And when Chuck came up, and I believe Chuck came from J. Lore. Did he come from J. Lore or did Steve? I believe he came from J. Lore. Okay, one of, one of, one of the other. Um, Chuck really flourished um, and brought Barden into a different um, quality of wine and, you know, brought different ideas, introduced different um, varietals to the community, and just had a, a gentle, both Barden and Chuck were both gentle souls working a very powerful message to the community and to the, and to the wine industry at large. So it was, it was a pleasure working with Chuck as well when we 
prior to building our facility, he was, we did custom crush at Stephen O. And Chuck did a beautiful job with our wines. And I was sorry that we got beyond 3,000 cases because that's when I had to break away and build a winery. And uh, Chuck was not, no longer our winemaker. But Chuck went on to um, continue with Barden Stephen O. And then branch off and do his own. He has, his, there is his own label. Unfortunately, we lost Chuck way before his time in 2014. But the hubby name and the hubby wine crafting is still going very strong within our community. Yeah, you see a lot of um, Chuck's innovation with Tempranillo. So he was awarded, um, this award and was only one of two American Tempranillos to be awarded this award. You know, he kind of, a lot of the pioneering spirit and the innovation with these early winemakers and winery owners really is seen today. Um, Hubby's Tempranillo is still one of, you know, the best Tempranillos in town because Chuck wanted to do a Tempranillo. Yeah. He wasn't afraid to experiment. <laughs> and um, Steve. Steve Collum. <laughs> he also um, wasn't afraid to try something new. So um, Stephen, just like a lot of the other early winemakers and winery owners, he was one of our vineyard, or our, one of our main vineyard managers. He um, moved up here and planted his Sangiovese grapes and since 1990 just had the consultant business and really helped a lot of the vineyards, you know, today plant, choose what they were planting. So like Gay said, you have the different soils, um, different areas. Stephen knew what he was doing and he knew what would grow well um, and pick something, you know, not necessarily that it sold well in the grocery store, picked it because he knew it would grow well up here. Um, and you talk to a lot of vineyard owners still today who say that Stephen was, you know, the reason they started growing a certain grape and it is thriving. He, he was also, while we did not use him as a vineyard consultant, um, you could always rely on him. You could call him and, and ask a question and he would come right out and, you know, help you with whatever it was you needed. Uh, he took great care with the people that he worked with, the, the people putting in vineyards to check their soils, to make the recommendation of put, it, put Syrah here. He was also very instrumental with um, certifying organic or sustainable. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was really passionate about that and passionate about the earth. And, you know, a, a, I, I should say a steward in his own, in his own way. And once again, we lost him way before we should have. Um, so the, the vineyards and the winemakers that have crafted um, wines from the grapes that he cultivated have just continued to prosper and utilize the same philosophy that, that he instilled in, in all of the vineyards that we have. Chloe, you worked with him for a number of years. Steve Millier, um, he also uh, started at Stephen O. And um, he and Liz I, have just brought so much information, joy, and power to this industry over the years that they have that they have been here. Um, they, he has his own winery, Millier Winery. He's also been the winemaker at Ironstone since the late 80s and purchasing, as Jody mentioned, purchasing black sheep. I don't know, I don't know when that happened, but it, he, kept, he kept that label and the quality of that, of that wine continuing to grow. He's, um, he's a class act and just somebody who was so much fun to work with. And I still, I sell fruit to him um, which is a godsend, but they, you know, they, they're old school, you know, they've been here a long time. They contribute to the community. They, he knows a lot, it, the history. Liz over the years, um, it has a knowledge of this, of, of this area, which is really valuable. So I, you know, it would be great to have her speak one of these days because, you know, anytime I, 
get confused about who was doing what, she can clarify it. He's a fine winemaker, a, a wonderful human being, and um, you know, to know that he, both he and Chuck were the winemakers at, at Stephen O, you know, prior to Barden's passing, it, it's a real tribute to Barden that he was able to bring these wonderful human beings and, and great winemakers up with us. Mm -hmm. And Steve today is still the, um, the lead winemaker at Ironstone, and he is still running the show at Millier. so. And John and Gail Counts, <laughs> which all of you know, I'm sure. Um, Gail's family has, um, has had the ranch up here for years, and which is where that they decided to build Ironstone. And it was in the late, it was, um, they opened just after we did. Um, so in 1990, probably six to eight months after Chatham opened on, on Highway 4 in Douglas Flat, was when um, Ironstone opened their caves and, uh, and their winery. And they, beyond a doubt, they have brought more employment to the area. Um, fascinating tours. The estate itself is, if you haven't been there recently, it's absolutely outstanding. Mm -hmm. And the, the venues that, were, that they are able to have there bring a number of people to our community and their wines are award-winning, uh, internationally award-winning. So uh, while Steve is still their head winemaker, I'm not sure how many employees they have, they, but they managed to employ a number of, of our Calaveras, um, Calaveras youth, you know, and they've done a tremendous job with bringing, with bringing a lot to the community, visitor, visitors, tourists, and, um, People who, people who want to know a little bit more about what we do. They craft millions of cases of wine. Unlike, I think I got up to 15,000. So <laughs> they, um, they've done a terrific job for the community and, and uh, the people here. Yeah, it's kind of a testament to our, our kind of background and, and spirit. You know, there are easily our biggest winery um, in the county but they still are family owned and operated um, so their kids are still a very big part of the business themselves so and like Gay was saying they do a lot for the community they're involved in everything donate to everything um, so then and there you go <laughs> <laughs> um, I was I was fortunate enough the, the name Chatham is from my mother's maternal side of the family uh, it, it, when they came over from northern Italy, it was Cotonio. Uh, can't spell it, haven't visited, but would love to, when I retire someday, <laughs> go and find out where I, I'm supposed to be from. Um, we had ranches in Tulare and Turlock. And in the late, in the mid, mid to late 70s, they called up and said, you need to diversify. So of course I raised my hand because I enjoyed drinking wine and said, why don't we plant why don't we plant a vineyard? Thus, was introduced to Barden Stevenau um, and came up, and the first property we looked at was the Macaulay Ranch. It was, it was where Greenhorn is. And it was on the market, it was at an auction, and the uh, a developer outbid us by $25,000, and so that's history, I mean, you know, what happened there. And so we ended up purchasing the old Higgins Ranch, which was also the old Earhart Ranch, which was originally the Davis Ranch, um, which is out on Esmeralda. So you go out Dogtown Road. Um, the ranch is about 750 acres, and we have 65 acres in cultivation of grapes. I, like I mentioned, I went back to school to figure out which end of the plant to put in the ground. Um, <laughs> And over three years, we did three different plantings uh, to satisfy the Stephen O need. Uh, over the years, we, had, we did change the complexion a little bit of the vineyard, so that we, while we didn't put in Tempranillo, we did put in Sangiovese. We have five different Portuguese varietals. Uh, we do have Semion, which is 
a little bit different from, from most people's plantings. I don't know who else has it in our, in our area. Um, but it's, it's uh, I had no idea what I was doing. And I, I thought, well, I'll just be there on the weekends. You know, it would be great. I was born and raised in San Francisco and I never went back. So I raised four children. My husband, George Stone, helped me raise four children. Um, and we, st we, while we sold, we started the winery, opened it in 1990, um, sold it in 2015. I, I miss my people, but I don't miss the politics of the paperwork and all of that. What you sampled today is our 2008 Cabernet Sauvignon, which we don't craft I don't craft wine anymore. So this came out of our library and I was delighted to be able to share it with you. And um, while I miss the wine making aspect of it, uh, the ranch has kept us very busy <laughs> and we're still on tractors and selling fruit and always looking for a new home for fruit. And it's, you know, we've been, we've been very fortunate that we have award-winning wine and uh, award-winning wine from award-winning fruit. Um, and working with the winemakers that we have over the years has really, uh, we've been able to develop really terrific relationships, both within Calaveras County, over in Amador County, as well as down in Napa. So um, always want more water, would love, I can't wait to hear <laughs> all about the water in Calaveras County. So I'll be here in February to find out if I can get more water. But it's, it's um, doing this for 43, going on 44 years, the, the people I've met and the experiences and the friendships and um, all of that has just been incredibly rewarding. And I, I, I can't take credit for, you know, ex expounding on you know, what's happened here because it really takes a village to do it and we've done it together. So um, I have to thank the other growers and, and all the other wine <laughs> winemakers because they're, they're really the ones that have assisted having all of this take place and having Calaveras be successful because now it's not just known for the jumping frog, it is known for award-winning wines and, um, and fruit. So. Yeah, it's, um, and I have to thank Jody for coming aboard with CWA because, uh, you know, not, not only is it a really a delight to have someone who knows everything about Calaveras County, but keep, we, we're keeping that feel of all of the wineries and all of the vineyards are family. None of them are these huge, massive, um, conglomerates that you you don't see the owner you know you go out to a vineyard and you're going to be kicking dirt with the owner you go into the winery and the owners in the back room but they're there so I have to thank you for coming aboard with us it's my pleasure <laughs> so um, Calaveras County today so this vineyard map is from 2019 so it is changed a little bit um, we are home to about 30 family uh, run tasting rooms and at this point with the last um, crop survey we're at about uh, 850 planted acres of grapes and like you can see on the map it is all over the county so we are really diverse um, because of our diversity you can enjoy um, 52 different varietals in the county um, so like Gay was mentioning with the planting of Stephen Hill, or for Stephen O, the different varietals, um, we got a lot. Yeah. So some of them are, are very small, you know, not many um, plants of them, but there is 52 varietals planted in the county, which is um, pretty amazing. Um, some of the grapes we're most well known for, Italian, Spanish styles, so Syrah, Tempranillo, Sangiovese, Zinfandel, Albarino, um, and like I said, a lot more. And that is it. I would um, recommend if you have any, you know, more want for knowledge, um, Judith, Judith's uh, History of Wine in Calaveras on the Calaveras History um, website is really awesome. A lot of, lot of information there. Um, 
Sandra, our former um, executive director during COVID, did a history of um, our, you know, Calaveras uh, wine interview series, and that's on the, the Wine Grape Alliance's website. Um, Gay, Judith, a um, lot, of, lot of different winemakers were all interviewed for that. I think there's eight um, videos in that series. And then um, got some of that also. Any questions? Um, early on, these settlers that came that brought the vines with them, mm -hmm. had they, did they know that if they, if there had never been vineyards here before, how did they know to bring vines in to wind up in Calaveras? Yeah, so there wasn't, um, I guess you could say necessarily vineyards, but there was vines. So the mission grape, um, kind of the natural growing grapes were here. So um, they, when they, I'm sure they might've brought some over initially, but when they got here, they could see, you know, the natural vines, how well they were growing. Um, so then I'm sure then they called upon more to just keep bringing them. And they brought what grew well in their area, probably hoping that they would grow well here. But like I said, our climate is very diverse. Yeah, I understand. Uh White wine is not as good made in the, in the hills rather than at the coast. It um, depends. Not yeah, not necessarily. It depends what white wine. Um, so Sauv Blanc, Simeon, Viognier, they are all more warmer weather grapes that can hold up to our heat. So it's really the heat that is the issue. But we have so many little microclimates. Um, one other one is like Pinot Noir. So Pinot Noir grows very well on the coast, but we do grow it up here just in very small microclimates. So we have some, qu quite a bit of white wine. It just more, you know, needs their own special, special places. So just for example, we have about 11 acres of Chardonnay and um, we sell that to the Hovey, to the Hovey family, the, the people that own Hovey now. And because, because of the valley that we're in, um, it, can get, it can get extremely warm but we also don't have fog, so it's we're very mindful of the temperatures. And when we're when we're ripening, we don't want you know it, the higher your sugar, the higher your alcohol is going to be in your wine. So we're we're mindful because they like a lower alcohol on their Chardonnay. So you're you're right. There are some Rieslings can't grow where I am. But like Bryce Station might be able to grow a Riesling because it's a little higher elevation and a little cooler. I don't believe he has a Riesling. And the only Pinot that I'm aware of is at Indian Rock closer to the creek. You know, so because Pinots do take a little cooler climate. Are there any wineries up here that grow a la Conte Boucher? Yes. Yeah. Trent. Uh, uh, Lavender Ridge. Where do they get those? That's purchased out of the area. There are some. Wait, is it like Amador? Uh, I think you might be making a California one now, and it's coming from the valley. Okay. But Grant yeah, Amador County grows Alicante Boucher. Yeah. Grant. Um, so the vineyard that, right when you're going out um, to Maloney's, right at the entrance of the Maloney's, that vineyard has some Alicante. But during the Prohibition, Calaveras County really boomed with wine. <laughs> <laughs> And I did meet a man at the museum many years ago from the valley who said when he was 16, his family were growing um, grapes and making grappa. And his father said, you get on that truck and you get out of here and you sell that grappa and don't come back. <laughs> and so you do. And he said he always knew he could sell it in Angel's was it, was, it, was it a Josie? Was it the Josie family, by the way? No, no. no it was um, he was from the San Joaquin Oh, Valley. God, that's funny. Yeah. But I know that up here, well, for instance, uh, the Starcevich place, the Star Saloon in, in Angel's Camp turned into a, uh, I don't know, an ice cream place, or as they all do, you know, selling ice cream and soft drinks. But the back room. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or downstairs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and it boomed, and I know the Dragonis told me that they used to just, People would come from all over, and they bring their jugs. Yeah. And they just yeah. 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 The, the Dragonis and the Vogelettis, and possibly the Cuneos. 
It, it, probably the Cody goes, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> we, we do a winemaking, and myself in a, in a historic landmark, and uh, Marion's sixth generation with ancient vines. We're, I'm very interested, is there any of these local wineries that are still on the dirt, that are still in the old caves that, that where you can go and see the, the, the old thing kind of still. Oh, wow. Old, old, hmm. I, I don't, I don't think so because, you know, over, over the years, like the Dugonis sold to Stephen O, um, the Vogelettis have sold their properties um, I know the Cuneos are still there, but but that it's a small family, you know, type of thing. So it, it would be hard to know. And with just the sellers going to Black Sheep, it's it's like it's hard to know who's who held on to old equipment. Mm -hmm. And that really, the only cave, the only cave that I'm aware of is you know is Ironstone now. Ironstone and Twisted. And Twisted, yeah. But those are newer. Those yeah. are new caves. Well, and, and Tanner, their, um, the property, um, Judith, you can probably correct me, but part of their winemaking, you know, this was a long time, their cellar, part of it's gone, part of it's still on the property, but it's not open for the public. You know, so they're probably all the, the little caves and winemaking places aren't necessarily open. You know, they're on family properties now. The but, liability but insurance is incredible, <laughs> so that's probably why people don't allow that. Mm -hmm. I know of several wine caves in the um, Macaulay Hill area, and where people made wine, and some of them were they're still filled with wine barrels, but they're all private, mm -hmm. and they're no longer making wine. The Boitano? Would it be the Boitanos? Would the Boitanos still have it, or no? I don't know. I know the McSorley Ranch. You might I'll, talk I'll to Judith. I've been involved with the McSorley Ranch, and I'm, I'm very aware of those. I mean, those are rhyolite caves uh -huh. from stone. But no, they, they are not open for public yeah. Yeah. either. Mm -hmm. Someone else had a comment? I, I just want to make a comment. Uh, I was born in Angel's Camp, lived down on Summit Road, and I'll tell you, the wine has come a long way. <laughs> <laughs> Next door, we had a man named Paul Lucini, and he made wine. He had a big vat in his basement. He made wine. On the other side was an Italian man named Andrew Caverni, and he would make it on his side. And my brother and I used to go over and say to my dad, we've got to come home, it's dinner time. And of course, Paul would always give us a little glass of wine with water. Oh, cute. And, uh, so we, we cute. tasted some pretty bad wine. <laughs> Um, I have a question regarding um, Zinfandel. Is it identical to Primitivo, or is it drifted from the Italian? It's it is it it's a it's a family. It's a it's a family, but it is different. You know, so it's um, but with the clones, with with how grapes have changed, and one mm -hmm. of the things for us, we're on our own rootstock, so we are definitely prone to any kind of disease that might come into play so we're very careful about any equipment that comes in but over the years you know with any kind of grafting and prim when primitivo came over it was primitivo and then with different clones and you have different clones of zinfandel as well mm -hmm. they're very similar but it's the same family but it's a derivative of like a like a distant cousin mm -hmm. kind of thing there's an old, old winery that was planted by Frenchmen in Salt Spring Valley. And I just wonder, the wine grapes are still very, they're growing in trees now. But is there some way to tell if we take the grape to Davis or something to tell what varietal? Yeah. So we, we should get a cutting of it. Do, do you know who owns the property? Yes. Okay, yeah. I would say get cuttings of it. Um, it's, that's fascinating. The more information we have about what's here in the community, mm -hmm. the better, you know. Well, I want to say too that Fred Cuneo, many, many years ago, 
gave me a bucket of sand filled with a lot of uh, cuttings of grapes, and I just kind of watered them for a couple of years. And then I planted one, and it now has a root stock like that, and it goes all the way three sides of my house in 10 years. <laughs> so, and they brought them from Italy. Uh -huh. Italy, he said, Fred said, in 1853. So they're very successful. They're not wine grapes, but they really do well there. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. One in the back. I was going to comment on another name that maybe should come up somewhere in this discussion with Dan Irving. Oh. Um, when I moved here in 77, yeah. I met him right away, which is about the same time I met Barton, and he was the absolute cheerleader as farm advisor, not only for here, but with the other three counties. And it, I remember listening to him angrily talking about why can't we be like Amador? Well, it, uh, it yeah. Valley, and it, we should include passing, him. I think he was a very key, key cheerleader in the early days of his revitalization. He was mm -hmm. our farm advisor at the time, and when I when I came up here, some of you may know the name Eldred Lane uh, from uh, Mountain Ranch, and um, Eldred introduced me to Dan Irving, and there were a couple of other farm advisors from the valley that came up and took a look at the ranch that, that we purchased was a cattle ranch and had hay on it. And where they were kicking the dirt and going upside down, and Dan, Dan was definitely spearheading and a great cheerleader, and he, he really should be included in our roots uh, run deep because he did, he did bring a number of us together and was very encouraging about, about keeping Calaveras going with that. But yeah, he, he was a great guy, really a great guy. I live in Tuolumne County and I've often wondered why there are so few wineries there here to Is it because of the soil or the climate? It's a really good question. I think, I, I don't know, um, I'm not in real estate, and so I don't know what kinds of properties. It seems, I mean, when I think of, when I think of Tuolumne, I think of Sonora, and then you've got you've Twain Heart, and you've got these pockets of population, so to speak. So I know that there are ranches. I mean, when you come out of Sonora past Chicken Ranch, there are any number of ranches, ranches that. Are mostly yeah. Mm -hmm. So it really it it could be interest. It could, I doubt if it's soil because we have some vineyards that they're not necessarily part of our membership organization because they're not Calaveras but they are involved um, in other ways and so there's vineyards over there but yeah it might just be more interest than than anything they're forever talking about trying to improve the tourism mm -hmm. for the county right right and it's a handful I think you have a handful of wineries it's it which is nice to handful, see yeah small, it's it's they're come it's coming along I think that it it's hard to I, I and I also don't remember what the what the elevation is. You know, I, I think anything above Miwok is going to be difficult, and and there and then there again, there's a lot of forestry land there where we have a, a, not as much. Well, we have more forestry land up farther, but it's I think it's just people doing their homework and yeah, there are more cattle ranches. You know down in that area. But it, they're, they're making great wines, the ones that, oh, good. yeah, it's yeah, good. they are all good. <laughs> to what degree do you sell to the Napa Valley winemakers? It's small, it's very, no. it's very small. Um, it, I would love to sell more to some of them because I'd be able to get twenty thousand dollars a ton for the cab. But <laughs> instead I was just of, wondering, it like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> it's um, yeah. They they um, there are a lot of Napa wineries that are are purchasing fruit out of Amador County a lot mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of uh, Napa 
growers that have purchased property over in in Amador. Not so much, not so much here, which is fine, you know, because right. we we like our we like our families, mm -hmm. you know, to stay. But it's small winemaker making, um, and it's small amounts. It's a half a ton here, it's a ton there, maximum five tons, you know, kind of thing. But it's you know, for us. For the association itself, there are a number of us this year that we're not able to sell all of our fruit. <clears throat> so it's, it's nice to be able to find a home for your fruit, whether it's Napa, whether it's Sacramento, whether it's Amador, whether it's Tuolumne County. You, know, you, want, you want to sell what you've cultivated all year. Do you think it is a size thing? Because, I mean, it would be tough to sell a half ton because that's just the transportation and the logistics of all that. Like, whereas, if you know, there's just not that much planted in Calaveras County. But a winery might be, in Napa, might be looking for, like, a lot. Um, well, pro I don't know. yes, prob probably. I mean, I, I, was, um, I was advertising that I had 10 tons of Cabernet available yeah. for sale. And <clears throat> there was a glut of fruit on the market this year for mm -hmm. sale. Uh, and not last year, but but this year. And part of what part of what I saw was COVID backed a lot of wineries up because they didn't have the restaurant trade. A lot of restaurants weren't able, you know, to purchase that fruit. So um, a couple of our wineries basically said to me, I, "I'm totally. I've got three vintages I'm backed up on. So I'll revisit next year." So they're trying to move their product. <clears throat> yes, with small winemakers, and, and most of the ones that we sell to in, in the Napa area are very small. And so they're looking, they're looking for quality fruit. We've been able to establish a good relationship with them. And it's, like I said, it's a half ton to five tons. That's, mm -hmm. that's about it. So. If, if it's more than, so I, I lost, <clears throat> years ago I was selling to Dry Creek. Barden, Barden stopped making Chenin Blanc. Ah! Um, I had all the Chenin Blanc to sell. And so I found Dry Creek Vineyards, which is in Healdsburg, and they took all of our Chenin. And then the next year, ATF and ABC said, you had to have 75% 70, of your product had to come from Healdsburg in order to call it a Healdsburg product. So I'm not sure right now if it stayed at 75%. I think so. Yeah. I you think could call it just California. You could call it California, but they did not want to call it. They didn't want yeah. to call it. California means you can buy it from anywhere and, and, and have it be a Chenin Blanc. You know. In our region, uh, Calaveras isn't necessarily on its own, we, we are the have, Sierra yeah, we, Foothills. We don't have an AVA, yeah. uh, which we continue to try to get an AVA, which means we're just identified as Calaveras County, um, but it's expensive. And then also we would have to identify the boundaries uh, of our region. And so years, years ago, this is, I don't know, it feels like it was pre-prohibition, but I was alive. <laughs> so years ago it was, no, Valley Springs can't be in it. You know, it's like, well, why can't Valley Springs be in it? You've got the Ghirardelli, I think the Ghirardelli Vineyard is down in Valley Springs. Well, we, but we don't want to be affiliated with it. And I'm like, oh my God, okay. So we had to go back to the drawing board. It is very expensive. We need a grant to be able to do it. It is very time consuming. And it would be really neat to be able to have Calaveras. We put ca we we used to put Calaveras on our label anyway, you know. But yeah, mm -hmm. we need the AVA. Yeah, Sierra Foothills is like 10, 10 11. 11, 11 11 counties, counties are yeah. considered Sierra Foothills. So, uh, what's your question? Estate grown goat? Was that your question? No, no, but just estate grown. It it would be like I was able to say estate grown because I everything that we cultivated we put into our own bottle right. and name. So does that mean that all of those eleven counties and none of them are an ABA? Amador is Amador is its own. Uh, El Dorado is uh, Shenandoah Valley. El Dorado is. I mean, but it, it they can say Sierra Foothills say. 
ABC buys fruit for me and some fruit from Inner Sanctum and da da da. They can they can they, they can say Sierra Foothills. If everything is from Amador or Shenandoah Valley itself, they have that. You all get an A. <laughs> okay, one more question. Uh, so, uh, kind of following the European tradition, uh, down in the valley, uh, the excess fruit problem was always solved by uh, running it through the still, and, and they'd make the tokay wine into the brandy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was there a history in Calaveras ever of, of that uh, extension, if you will, of, of this industry? Was there ever a still here other than the grappa that were uh, Are you talking just grappa or stills? Yeah. Still. Just yeah. 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 The distilleries? Uh, but I, I'm unaware. Industry. I'm unaware of where they might be. I don't be. know that they were commercial, but you know, in doing the archaeology around this county, you find them all the time. <laughs> and there's a really interesting one out of Greenhorn Creek. Well, it's actually on Goldfield property. They were using mining tunnels. And then we go and we say, what is this pipe coming out of the top here? <laughs> yeah. So there was a lot of that going on, but I don't think it was commercial. Well, oh, or legal. <laughs> <laughs> but, like for, but the Cuneos made, um, uh, what do you call it, brandy and yeah. sold it. Yeah. Yeah. Out of Louise's basement. Pardon? Probably out of <laughs> Louise's basement. Yeah. Yeah. I have a funny story. So I was involved with the McSorley wine caves. And very early on, I was down there with a member of the family. And I looked at this part of it, and it was this alcove cut in the solid rock, with, like you say, there was obviously fire going on and a stack going up through the ground. And I, said, I said, Wow, this is where the still was. And she goes, Oh no, oh no, there was not a still there. Never was a still. I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, they, our our website and um, some of the some of the short films and short interviews are, are really fun, and and a lot of uh, very informative, but a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And and if any of you have more questions, you can always get a hold of us through CWA. Judith is a wealth of information yes. about the community and, and the wine industry itself. And um, thanks for coming yeah, today. Thank you. We had a good time. Yeah.